Good evening, everyone, um, and welcome to our latest webinar of Let's Talk Cattle. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined this evening by Dr. Andrew Crabby of ICBF. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about, um, I suppose, a program that we, we are in the, the midst of, I suppose, at the minute in, in the suckler industry, um, the, the BDGP program, which has been running now for six years, is heading into its seventh year, and we have an extended year on it from the Department of Agriculture. Uh, and it's... Um, a program, I suppose, has caused a bit of controversy as well as showing us the way, I suppose, in terms of genetics and in terms of breeding for our suckler industry. And um, Andrew is going to go through a bit about what, what's, the, what's the program actually delivered over the last number of years? Where are we going? What is it starting to show us in terms of trends? And, and maybe we might speculate a small bit about where, where it should go in the future. So you're very welcome this evening, Andrew, to, to chat to us about this. Thanks for coming on. Thanks very much, Alan. And anyone that wants to ask questions, you can type them in and we will answer them at the end when the, when the questions are over. Um, so just, just keep an eye on that and, and you can type them in as, you, as you're listening along the way. So I'll leave it with you there, Andrew. First of all, thanks very much for the opportunity to come on to the programme here this evening and uh, you know, to, to talk about where we've got to in the context of the beef data and genomics programme. And, and as you say, uh, maybe some... Um, yeah, discussions in, in terms of where we might go in the future. So, so maybe just a few slides as background in, in, in the context of genetic improvement within the suckler beef herd. And, and look, these are the traits that uh, make up the Eurostar replacement index. That index was really uh, put in place in, in 2012 initially, um, updated in 2014 with updates on those economic values from, from Chagas from Chagas Grange, but these are the traits that drive profitable suckler beef production, you know, and, and you can see that the overall weighting is on the, the, the cow, the maternal traits, about 71% of the weighting on the cow traits and about 29% of the weighting then on those progeny or the calf growth traits. Um, and of course, the Eurostar index is then overlaid into a five star or five 20 percentile system. So that allows us to identify the animals that are in the top 20% or the top 40%. And of course, that information then is available, uh, whether it's on bull searches or catalogs or available for individual animals. So that's how we've structured the, the, the Eurostar indexes to really help generate genetic improvement within the, the suckler beef herd. I mean, as I said, they were introduced or updated in 2014 with that focus, particularly on the maternal traits, because what we had seen was uh, you know, for quite a number of years, uh, an increasing focus on the terminal traits and that those maternal traits. So whilst we'd got growth and efficiency, we were starting to lose milk and fertility. So that was the big objective of the, um, the replacement index when it was uh, first introduced and continues to be the focus uh, as we look forward into the future. Uh, those early days, a, a big part of the work on the index was really around validation, giving us confidence that the indexes was starting to move us in the right direction. And, uh, you know, this was a piece of work done by undertaken by Dr. Alan Toomey there, a sucker beef farmer from North Cork, from working with Chagas. Um, and look, in, in this analysis, um, you know, uh, we we'd went back, or Alan had went back right to, you know, cows born in 2012 and 2013 and got there their Eurostar evaluations at that point in time, and, and then was looking at their subsequent performance in terms of, well, how did they calve down? How did they recalve? How did their progeny perform? And I suppose it was this type of analysis that gave us a, a lot of confidence that the indexes were certainly moving us in the right direction, you know, breaking it into three groupings there. Um, you can see that compared to the lower indexed animals, those high indexed animals consistently were, you know, younger age at first calving, shorter calving interval, um, a lighter cow surviving longer with a heavier calf, a better wean and efficiency, less calving problems, but really with no loss in, in progeny Clark traits. So it really give us confidence that the index was starting to move us in the right direction. And, and then the question is, well, you know, um, if we're moving in the right direction, how can we go faster? And, 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 and that's certainly a a focus of where we're at with the programme now and certainly it's something we, we come back to towards the towards the end. Um, if we, if and we go back the... there Andrew, just one slide yeah. I suppose, that, that, that last slide I suppose dispels the myth that we often hear if you look at the carcass weight that you know you're, you're losing carcass significantly by going down the maternal route. 
Um, you know, you're getting what you're five days less towards towards slaughter, and you're more or less the exact same carcass weight. So it kind that's of validates the. And and that's exactly what the uh, index was endeavouring to do was to just shift some of the emphasis away from growth the growth traits and confirmation traits and onto milk and fertility. So we had no effectively we were looking to just slow down that gain that uh, that had been happening on the growth traits because we did look as an industry we don't need bigger cattle. Everybody would acknowledge that at this stage we don't need you know um, bigger um, mature cow weights say for example. Like, you know, mm-hmm. so that was the objective, and, and look, it's very positive to see see that actually happen. And then, of course, what we're looking at there is the the performance of the you know that's a steer steer uh, performance uh, um, corrected to a third parity cow, so really okay. excellent performance. And then, then in terms of the the terminal index, that's the other index, the replacement index, and you know, um, again, we 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 bring progeny in for into Tully. Uh, from the um, various AI SARS that are in the Gene Ireland program. And, and again, this is a piece of work undertaken by Dr. David Kelly, or David Kelly, who's undertaken his PhD there with Chagas as well. And, and look, what's it telling us? It's that these higher genetic merit animals in terms of the terminal index, you know, it, and, and again, this is based on, on the animals being their indexes, taking their indexes from when they were at calves and, and those high indexed animals. Are, are slaughtering heavier, um, 25 kilos heavier, but seven days younger, uh, with better kill out percentage uh, and, and really no difference in pre-slaughter live weight. So the, the gains in carcass weight are really coming from that, that improvement in kill out percentage, which is again, uh, something that's very desirable from, a, from a, a, a suckler beef and particularly those terminal traits perspective. So again, confidence, the index has taken us in the right direction. And the question then is, you know, how do we go faster? In the context of the go faster, it's important then also to put, um, you know, that focus that we've talked about around, uh, you know, we call it profitability, the profitability traits, the performance traits that drive profitability. But it's also important then to put it in the context of the the, the broader role that ro- that breeding can have in the context of the whole climate and then environmental challenges. And this is the, the marginal abatement cost curve um, that's been developed by Chagas or was, has been developed over a number of years. And, and these are the, the, the key activities that farmers can engage in that will um, help to um, um, improve the carbon footprint of our, our animals and our, of our herd in the future. And I suppose it's important to appreciate that, um, you know, breeding is there within that. Um, dairy EBA is obviously in there, but the beef improvements through those are replacement and terminal indexes are in there as well. And I suppose it's an important acknowledgement that, um, that breeding has a role to play, a very important role to play in the context of breeding more climate and environmentally efficient cows. Um, and that was certainly, um, uh, has been a was an important aspect that we were starting to consider in the early days of the BDGP in, in terms of appreciating the direction of travel that we were now on with regard to mm. the whole climate and environment piece. And that, that's a fair comment, I suppose. Back in seven or eight years ago or more, we, we were probably hearing a bit about carbon, but uh, uh, the effects of it, but not many were, were really taken too seriously. But I mean, you can see now what's happening with in, in in the climate change committee etc it, it's it's absolutely to the and i think and i think that's a you know you know we i suppose in many ways alan you know the, the bdgp has perhaps got criticized and not perhaps in some quarters has got criticized some people ask the question was it ahead of its time you know was genomics mm-hmm. well enough bedded in was the was the was there really the need to have this really strong focus on the maternal traits and in that sense, it probably was ahead of its time, you know. And um, if you think about it in the context of the program, I'm talking about the, the tools we were putting in place in 2012, 13, 14. And then this was the program that came forward in 2015 as part of that, you know, six year program that went forward to the EU Commission as part of our rural development program. And 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 and, and as part of that, it was the objective was really around breeding more profitable, sustainable and carbon efficient cows and farmers were then paid 
actions to complete or say paid monies to complete key actions um, associated with um, delivering the, the outcomes that we wanted to achieve in the context of the scheme. Um, whether it was genotyping, data recording, the four and five star cows, bulls, four and five star bulls, et cetera. So these were the actions and, and certainly some of these actions were the ones that certainly caused a lot of angst um, amongst, um, you know, amongst some farmers and, and, and breeders and parts of the industry um, because we were very much introduced in something new, but, um, mm. but it was introduced in something new in the very clear expectation that and, and look, that was the, the foresight in many ways the Department of Agriculture had that they anticipated that this is the way this is going to move. Absolutely. And, and Ireland are going to, you know, we're, we're sitting out on a limb and we have a large suckler beef herd and we need to start to be able to, you know, present a really strong case around why we need to continue to invest in that suckler beef herd. So that was the context, that was the background to the BDGP. And, and as I said, even if you went back to that Foodwise 2020 25 uh, document, which has now since been updated, the 2030 mm -hmm. document was just updated there at the end of last week. You know, a key part about that was it talked about smart green growth, and it was about using the, the, the very latest cutting edge technology, genomics, to help support an important indigenous industry. So, really, really, um, you know, if you talk about foresight in terms of helping position our suckler head where it now needs to be, you know, I think we're certainly in a, in a very, very strong place. And, and look, that program, that initial BDGP, you know, again, is, a, an ex, I suppose, an evidence of a continued commitment. You know, that has been supplemented with the additional BEEP scheme in 2019 that rolled into 2019-2020 and is going forward now into 2021 as well. So, um, look, all, all very, very positive developments from a, 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 an infrastructure perspective. And look, in terms of some of the enablers, look, the, the, the people that are on the call will be well familiar with, uh, you know, some of these dashboards, smart display boards, reports. You know, from an ICBF standpoint, our role then was really about supporting the program on the ground. Um, and making sure then that farmers could complete the actions, could record the data, could have visibility in terms of what was happening, you know, um, could, to, could use the systems to whether it was booking scales or buying heifers or benchmarking reports, you know, a lot of work and activity in the background then to help to enable the scheme and, uh, and, and, and take us towards our desired outcomes from a, a, an initial objectives perspective. And I suppose that really raises the question, which is the key purpose of this session will, you know, have the programs delivered relative to that uh, initial, um, those initial objectives. And I suppose, look, it, it would be remiss of me not to acknowledge that, you know, the scheme got off to a rocky start. And um, this was the front page of the Farmers Journal uh, back in late, uh, well, late, it would be early 2015, mm. you know, and I think, I think, you know, the frustration was, was, was palpable, was clear, but it was because this was a new scheme that farmers were really very unsure about, uncertain about, didn't know what was going to happen. And um, look, I think as, as time has moved on, you know, look, um, the fact that uh, so many farmers have, you know, initially engaged with the scheme and, 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 and got, uh, you know, over the line in terms of those eligibility requirements, you know, has, 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 has certainly confirmed that um, the initial apprehensions, whilst justified, uh, haven't, haven't manifested themselves in terms of uh, where we've got to uh, at the end of the programme. And, and look, that's reflected in, 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 in some of the outcomes, you know, um, like uh, I'm, I'm looking at the, this slide is just looking at the, ge the genetic trends, like these are two key lines in terms of how we monitor performance in the context of the suckler beef herd. You know, the gray line here is the um, genetic trend for replacement index based on year of first calving. So down at the bottom axis, these are the heifers calving in. So say, for example, the replacement heifers that calved in in 2020, they had an average replacement index of about 90 euros. But critically, what you'll see is that, you know, that index had been declining quite steadily 
for quite a number of years. And this was, you know, as we focused on the growth traits, the orange line, we were effectively disimproving or um, washing out those um, those favourable milk and fertility genes. Um, okay. But obviously the terminal, the replacement index came in in 2012 and helped to start to stabilise that at, at least for those farmers that were focused on um, breeding on higher replacement indexed animals. But then the BDGP came in in 2014, 2015 and really has helped to accelerate that. So, and, and it has done that by just simply taking a bit of this relative gain, this weight off the orange line. Uh, which is the terminal traits. And, you know, the next slide here, Alan, just maybe shows that a bit more clearly. This is the genetic trend for milk. You can see it had been declining. The genetic trend for calving interval had been increasing. So getting cows were uh, having longer calving intervals, which is undesirable. And really the BDGP has really helped to turn turn that around. And, and it's done that, as I said, just by by taking some of the emphasis off these growth traits, carcass weight and carcass conformation. And, and it would be important to appreciate and acknowledge doing this is, is a huge task and a huge outcome. You know, in many ways, it's like turning a ship, you know, um, and that's effectively what we managed to do. Uh, and that's hugely positive because we needed to do it. But of course, that's exactly, you know, one of the reasons why, again, the scheme was, Oh, so much angst and, and initially was, you know, all of a sudden, I don't want to say a different type of animal, but, um, you know, we were shifting the focus onto maternal traits and away from the growth and output traits that uh, farmers had sort of been so uh, focused and used to in, in, in the past. In, in terms of looking back then at, um, you said, you know, the, the, the maternal the replacement heifers are coming in between you know, 80, 90 euros now. How long would it take roughly for them to get over the 100 mark? Would it be, yeah, are we so talking our, five years or? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so our rate again currently, we're running at, you know, certainly it's about three, four euros per year gain. And, um, and look, that's one of our, 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 our focus areas is that, you know, how do we accelerate that rate again? If I just go back to the previous slide, um, you know, uh, this gives you a sense of the current rate again that we're achieving. So we've gone from, you know, if you go back to 2013, we were sitting at about 70, we've gone to, to, to 90. So three, four euros, it's accelerated a bit here. Yeah. Um, so you're right with that sustained gain. And look, we, we would talk to, we're doing some sessions actually with Suckler Bee Farmers at the moment, and we're putting it out there, you know, of a target gain of five euros per year in your replacement index. And that's achievable. But to do that, I mean, you need to be, you know, running at a 20% replacement. If you're running at a, a 15, 20% replacement, means you, you need to have your replacement heifers effectively 20, 25 euros ahead of your cow head. And that'll okay. get you your five euros per, 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 per uh, gain per year. Yep. Okay. Okay. So maybe just then picking up some of the uh, in terms of well, where are we at in terms of trends in, in performance? And and you know, I've talked about the high level trends. Well, what's actually happened in the ground in terms of outcomes? And look, this one's particularly interesting here because we're looking at three quarter bred steer slaughtered under 30 months, you know, and you know, we're looking at a 10 year trend here. And crucially, we're looking at the years here 2015 through to 2020. And I know it was a concern a lot of people raised that, you know, again, by taking the focus or taking some of the emphasis off carcass weight and conformation, would we be reducing down the weights coming from the suckler beef herd? You, you alluded to, to it earlier on, Alan, but it could simply not the case. You know, in fact, the steer carcass weights are still running at 380 plus kilos. In fact, last year they were up to 390 kilos. And if anything, the age of slaughter is reducing down slightly. Uh, with no real change in carcass conformation. So look, very, very positive outcome um, in terms of, um, you know, where we're at with, uh, with regard to carcass performance. I suppose one that's maybe a bit harder to shift and to, to, to move is, is the whole area of, of, of female fertility. And whilst this one is certainly moving in the right direction, um, you know, it's much slower. Um, and it, that's the way it's going to be. It's a, it's a lower heritability trait, it's more difficult to influence um, as a consequence of genetics. 
But we're very confident, if you recall earlier on, that genetic trend for female fertility turned around. Now, the first of the heifers that were really better on female fertility were only really calving in 2018, 2019, 2020. Um, but certainly very confident that as those genes build up, that these metrics around calves per cow per year will continue to increase. Of course, there'll be some seasonal year to year variation based on weather, et cetera, but certainly very confident that, you know, that they'll continue to nudge up 0 0.86, 0 0.87, 0 0.889. You know, the calf to two years of age is one that we're particularly interested in as well. It's currently sitting at 25%. It's gone up from 19. Could we improve it further? Certainly one that we're very keen in the context of the whole, you know, climate environmental discussion. Is that one that we could maybe make some inroads on in the next uh, BDGP? I'd come back to that at the end. Uh, calving interval is, is moving in the right direction as well. Um, so these are moving in the right direction, but uh, again, we'd acknowledge that you know, it'll take time. Genetics isn't a quick fix, you know, but certainly confident that these are moving in the right direction. And if you, if you just go back to that slide for one quick second, you can see there you mentioned weather related, et cetera. And we remember the, the bad uh, back in the 2017 and the bad spring of 18. You can see that it did. Absolutely. The, you know, the, it is effect when, when cows are housed into the month of May and, you know, yeah. fodder is tight, et cetera. It does have an effect, but that's right. that's evidence of it. Yeah. But I mean, in many ways, this slide then gives us the confidence that the indexes are, are certainly moving us in the right direction because, you know, this is an analysis again undertaken by David Kelly there in Chagas, um, suckler beef farmer actually from Kildare. And um, he's, um, you know, in this analysis, he, he took the, um, the, the herd replacement index data. So guys would be getting their Eurostar index reports. And, and, and he has looked at, that set of data uh, and ranked the herds based on the replacement index. So you can see the top 20% of herds had a replacement index then of 122 euros and the bottom 20% at 42 euros. And then independently, he had a, a number of sets of data to work with. And the first set of data he had was coming from beef. So these herds, there were 3,100 herds in total, had um, been weighing their cows and calves as part of beef. So we had the data coming from their beef reports, the reports that farmers would have got there just a, a number of months ago in relation to their cow live weights and calf weights um, and weaning efficiencies. And if we look at that data, what do we see? We, well, we see that the, the high replacement indexed herds on average had a, a cow live weight of 650 kilos compared to 690 kilos. They had a, a heavier weanling and a better weanling efficiency. And this is very consistent across, you know, as you move across these 20 percentiles. And similarly, the, another piece of work that he did on that context was he took the five year trend reports that farmers would have got. Again, they got those in January there. And again, what do we see based on those five year trend reports? Well, is that on average calving intervals are moving from 399 days in the bottom 20% to 387 days in the top 20%. And similarly, calves per cow per year are going from 0.85 up to 0.91. So again, coming back to my point there earlier, Alan, that very confident that you know these indexes are certainly moving us in the right direction because the higher replacement indexed herds certainly have a better performance metrics for 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 these female fertility traits as well as the the growth of the weanling efficiency traits, and that also reflects through into their profit monitors because. A, a subset of the herds did a profit monitor data, and you can see that there the profit per livestock unit in these herds, the top 20% of the herds, there was a difference there of about over 50 to 50 to 60 euros in terms of additional profit per livestock unit, which again is a move in the right direction. And crucially, also in the context of the program, he also had access to the carbon footprint data coming from Board B. So uh, again, these would have been herds that are in S blast and would have completed a, a board B a carbon audit. And you can see that the bottom 20% were running at 13.1 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per kilogram of live weight off the farm compared to 11.9. So again, you know, really giving us confidence that uh, we're, we're, we're well set up in terms of, you know, the indexes are validating and, 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 and moving us in the right direction. And they keep coming back to question then is, well, how do we, how do we start to push on 
be even further into the future. Maybe just then to, to, to pick up some of the newer bits of data that we're also looking at now that gives us confidence that we're moving forward in the right direction. Um, and this is data that we're collecting at Tully, uh, direct measurement of, of methane output. So we have about six over six, almost 700 animals that have gone through Tully, that have gone through these green feed um, machines or systems. Uh, and these are animals that are all progeny of different AI sires. Um, and, and we bring them into Tully and they're, they're there for a performance test period. And we collect and feed intake and efficiency. And as part of that, we're also collecting um, a direct measurement of their methane output per day. And look, we're picking up clear breed and gender differences. You know, if you look at this table down here, it's interesting to see, not surprisingly, we know uh, young bulls are, are more efficient than, than and steers or heifers. Uh, they have a lower methane output per day. Um, and similarly, it's interesting to see that the suckler beef animals, you know, are more efficient than the dairy beef animals uh, from a dry matter of feed intake, but also from a methane output perspective, which again is, a, is an interesting, you know, piece of data that we're now starting to pick up uh, in terms of some of the breed and gender differences. I think and, and more would that would that figure, Andrew, for the suckler versus the dairy? Would that include the suckler cow? Is that or is that just in no, their this is a per period? animal figure? This is just a per animal right. figure. Individual. And obviously, whenever you start to factor in the, the, the full suckler cow picture, yeah, I mean that that efficiency okay. would 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 uh, obviously you know would rest more with the dairy cow at that stage. But then you get yes. into a different conversation about stock extensification <clears> and stocking rate and all of that part. Yes. So um which you know tips the a bit of that balance back in favor of the suckler cow as well. So, so anyway, but I suppose what's more interesting, or certainly more interesting from a, a, an ICBF standpoint, is what, what's happening with methane output when we look at it in the context of the indexes. And, and this is really positive and re reassuring is that the, the, high, the higher indexed animals have the lower methane output per day. Okay. And this is crucial because it again just gives us absolute confidence that our indexes that by breeding on the terminal index, by breeding on the replacement index, we're actually uh, reducing down methane output per day. So this is an important validation that that initial goal of breeding more carbon efficient animals, cows and, and progeny is absolutely happening now. Um, and look, our, we're directly measuring this data now, methane yield data in Tully, and our goal is to have genomic predictions for methane yield. And, and look, that that would become a new trait that, uh, you know, per, people on the call could anticipate starting to see in terms of uh, a new evaluation potentially there uh, in, in, in 2022. So very positive may, developments in this area. And maybe it brings the question in as, you know, with regards, we did a lot of talk about low carbon beef, et cetera, being part of marketing strategies in the future, but does that bring the swing back then to young bulls away from steers again? Um, yeah, and look, and, and that certainly, uh, you know, you have to trade that there, there, there's a benefit there, but then there is a, a market piece around, you know, trying to promote and sell that. And, um, you know, there is no doubt about it. If we can position our uh, beef as, uh, you know, you know, it's suckler, it's said in the context of the, this, 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 what we're here on about here, it's suckler bread, it's, it's steers, it's heifers, it's, it's guaranteed, you know, committed in terms of low carbon, because that's our, you know, that's our pathway here. I think, look, there's a very, very strong proposition. Um, you know, in terms of, you know, that green image and that whole quality and taste and that we know is there also with steers and heifers relative to young bulls. That's a key okay. point. Okay. I suppose maybe just uh, as we finish here, maybe a, a few, you know, if I talk about some of the high impact areas that we're interested in now in the context of, you know, if we start to think through in terms of future programs, but more generally in a a broader industry perspective. And one of the ones I think we have to get bring on to the table is a whole discussion around the potential that a trait such a change at slaughter can bring us. You know, and, and we need to put that into the context of, you know, um, there's a lot of people now looking at the suckler beef herd and, and have come to the conclusion that the only way we're going to achieve the greenhouse gas reductions that we need from our agri-food industry is to cut cows. And, and the suckler cow is, 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 the, is the, the part of that that's under, we'll call it most intense focus. And I suppose the question that we'd ask and 
put out there is, well, look, if you take that we're slaughtering 1.32 million prime cattle per year, and this is the average performance, uh, 345 kilos, 26, day, 26 months uh, age of slaughter. And based on the data we just talked about previously there from Tully, uh, we know the methane per day, that uh, it's on average 250 grams per day. For each one month reduction in um, days to slaughter, for each 30 days, that's the equivalent of, and if you can, if do, we do, when you multiply the sums up, it's the equivalent of a, a saving of uh, almost 250 kilotons of greenhouse gases. Um, and to put that into context, you know, that's a, well, it's, it's, it's the equivalent of um, 4% of the total, the total greenhouse gas output from our, 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 our cattle herd, or to express it in probably in a way that resonates more strongly with people, it, it's the equivalent or the, of not having to potentially cull 100,000 cows, whether they're dairy cows or beef cows, it's 100,000 cows. So it's a really important point that for every one month reduction that we're prepared to, to, to push in terms of age at slaughter, it's the equivalent of not having to potentially cull 100,000 cows. And, and that's why I think it's important that we think about this as a potential proposition because there are certainly people um, and some, it could, it may be out of sight of our control unless we start coming forward with solutions that will simply look to, to, to bring in more draconian measures such as um, restricting or culling animals from the national herd and that's in no one's best interest so a real opportunity mm. maybe to think positively about some of the carbon climate profitability efficiency gains that we can get from younger age at slaughter a very, very stark figure there andrew what you're showing you know in terms of like the effect that it could have and i mean we've seen these headlines for the last number of months now coming from different reports and and you know it's, it's causing a lot of outrage amongst farmers but you know, not to be preempting it, but maybe it's time to put a carrot in, instead of a stick in front of people. Uh, maybe some kind of a an early slaughter premium or something. Something well, like there twenty Alan, years I ago. Think we have, yeah. I think I think you're absolutely right, and I think it's a there's an onus on us all. But it's it, it's farmers really need to lead this. You know, mm. um, you know what are the credible alternatives? You know, and 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 this one, this is very well aligned with, you know, efficiency with profitability with sustainability there's lots of win-wins here you know yeah. and um, you know there's blueprints in place there's you know lots of support I acknowledge the point there's additional costs but i think look if there's an openness and a willingness for farmers to respond to if there were some you know um, incentives or structures put in place to help to promote that however that might happen whether that's through future mm. programs or through uh, you know bonuses or whatever it is i think it has to be seriously looked at and considered absolutely mm. and it can be done i mean we have farmers that are doing it uh, year absolutely. in year out uh, much earlier slaughter ages and it's it's yeah. management as much as anything but you know it is it, and it's mindset you know it's a lot yeah. of it is also mindset just being prepared to you know so. yeah exactly I mean, you know, the other high impact one, look, again, most of the, you know, the sucker beef herd, all of our cows are, are genotyped at this stage. Um, but certainly we see a lot of benefits to transitioning in, you know, the, to, to, to effectively moving to a DNA every calf. So as part of your, your calf registration in the future would just be simply DNA tagging and, and you're tagging your male calves and your female calves and, and everything is getting done at birth and, you know, one of the challenges we had in the, you know, just guys would have complained about, you know, they wanted their tags before the calves went out and it was a bit of a hassle getting them back in. Well, all of that would be tidied up with this. Um, now, I would accept some people might ask, well, do we really need to, do, you know, there's some additional costs there and do we really need to do it for the male calves? And the one thing I would say on that one is, you know, increasingly we are looking also at these terminal traits because that's where some of the quick wins are around growth, feed intake, efficiency, carbon, methane, um, you know, age of slaughter. So certainly the need to have these genotypes and these male calves that are going to be slaughtered is certainly, you know, compared to where we were four, six years ago, you know, that's where we now are with regard to the, 
the next six years. So certainly there's a very strong case around, um, you know, this being coming a, a cost incurred aspect of the, the next programme as well. But I think there's also some real benefits that not just the scheme participants would get out of that, but there's a wider benefit that the industry starts to get. I mean, we have the opportunity to be world first in this space in terms of actually, you know, having a, a completely DNA verifiable uh, beef herd. Uh, and, and that's a very, very positive from an image perspective. There's also the whole benefits around accelerating genetic gain and all of that sort of stuff. But certainly we'd acknowledge there's a, a cost sharing aspect to this because it's not just the scheme participants would benefit from it. There's a broader industry will benefit. And look, there's an openness we certainly sense from that broader industry to, 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 to have those sorts of discussions. So a very positive developments we anticipate in, around this whole area of, of genotyping. So maybe just to finish, Alan, like, you know, um, if we go back to the, the BDGP, some of the challenges and, and the, the opportunities that we, we encountered, you know, in many ways, one of the initial objectives of the BDGP was to mimic the genetic gain that had been achieved in dairy. People understood that, um, you know, EBA had worked in dairy, and this is the rated genetic gain that is, uh, has been achieved in EBA over the course of the last uh, 15, 20 years. And, and look, um, you know, every dairy farmer just accepts and acknowledges EBA works and genomics is working. And, and, and I suppose that was one of the, certainly the, 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 the core principles whenever the BDGP was being developed was, well, could we bring this technology uh, and bring it in as a, as a key part of the, the BDGP? Because getting gain on beef and suckler beef, you know, was massively challenging. You know, the low levels of AI, it's only 20% compared to 70% in dairy. We have a multiplicity of breeds, small herd size, challenges around profitability, part-time farming. So it was really about bringing this new disruptive technology called genomics and, and bringing it in as a core part of that. And look, as a consequence, the, the program and, and all of the support that there has been on the ground in terms of, you know, um, whether it's, you know, advisors or support networks in terms of, you know, um, you know, in terms of, you know, access to skills, the data recording, the marts, all of that sort of stuff, you know, to think that we're now turned that around. And, and the rate again here on replacement index is running at about 60% of the current rate that the dairy EBA is running at. And, and, you know, some people would ask, is that good enough? Well, I think it's remarkable to think it is at that level. But certainly the goal now going forward has to be to accelerate that further because we absolutely know that if we can do that now, well, then we can continue to improve profitability, sustainability, pull down that greenhouse gas output and, and really position our herd, our suckler beef herd for an even more stronger and positive future uh, as we look forward um, going forward. And, and and, and, and in that context, you know, we talk about the, the areas, I mentioned some of them in the context of, of this, um, you know, what we've covered so far, the areas that certainly we're having discussions with in terms of with, you know, in the, you know, the, 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 but the participants, the department, the, with the, the, the industry, you know, it's around genotyping. The, the, the beef part, the, the way in the cows and calves is sitting separately. Is there an opportunity to bring that back in? I think there is. Everybody's saying that is, and that's a bit of feedback that we're getting. Mm. And, and then there's some others that, you know, the, the two-year calving, some people are doing it. You know, some others have a real concern about it. You know, that's an open question, but there's no doubt that there's benefits. I think everybody would acknowledge, can we go faster, but how we, might we do that? Carbon auditing is certainly something we, we see a really important role for. Previously, farmers did the carbon navigator and um, give us a sense of where it was at, but maybe we need to be a bit more robust uh, if we, as we look forward into the next program, um, because we know the auditing is being done by quite a number of the participants through Board BIA. Is that something that could potentially be considered? And of course, you know, we also know that the knowledge transfer piece at the very start of the scheme worked very, very well, the initial engagement and training. And is that something, certainly we would feel that there's a strong case for, for an additional, additional knowledge transfer component. So these are just some of the areas, as I say, that are being are open, open and up 
and being discussed broadly at the moment uh, amongst uh, amongst the the, the the scheme participants. So, so look, okay. thank you very much for that. Also. Thanks, Andrew. And before we hand it back to the audience now for questions, we just look on that slide. Um, you know the EBI versus the the beef replacement things. It's been put out there, I suppose, that the, the EBI probably delivered four cent a litre or, or something like that to the dairy farmers in terms of extra profit. It, just to put a, put, I know you're putting yourself out there by saying this, but if you were to gauge, if we were to follow the same trajectory, say go ten years down the road and we follow the dairy the dairy trajectory, what could it be worth in terms of cents per litre on beef? Yeah, would you have be able to gauge it? I mean, certainly there's a few cents per kilo per year. Absolutely. Mm. You know, um, you know, if I look from the and, 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 and over 10 years, you know, you're into 20 or 30 cents a kilo. And, mm. and that's, uh, you know, that's that profitability benefit. You know, the addition, if you if you compare the animal that you had in 10 years time compared to the animal that you had, you know, back then, which is exactly the exercise that dairy farmers do. They, they you know, look at this, sorry, they look at this heifer that calved in in 2020 compared to the one that they had in 20. 2005 and they absolutely know that she's delivering now an extra 30 kilos of milk solids she has a shorter calving interval she's surviving longer and it's worth four cents per litre in milk price yeah. and, and and i'm confident that we're starting to move to get those sort of metrics similarly for 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 supper beef farmers because we saw them earlier on in terms of where the the best yeah. of the herds are currently at you know it's 0.9 calves per cow per year per compared to uh, 0.8 calves per cow per year you know that's a that's a cab that's 700 euros a thousand euros in um you know a typical uh, 20 cow herd um you know you express yeah. that into cents per kilo and uh in terms of profitability at the end of the year and and that's the sort of differences that you're talking about all of well and, and if you look at it then today's take today's beef price an r grade heifer will, will you know will qa will get you around 430 a kilo i mean if, if if the equivalent in the genetic gain is going to gain you another 30 cent, that's the equivalent of getting 460 for a, a high index herd versus low index. So you can see where profit starts to generate there. Um, so look, thanks thanks very much for that, Andrew. We, we'll finish up our section here and we'll hand it back to the audience here now. Uh, again, the Q&A tab there is at the bottom of the screen. Anyone who wants to um, put in their questions, just type them in and we'll, we'll, we'll answer them for the next 15 minutes or so. Okay, Andrew, so we'll, we'll just go through there a few that are coming in. Um, the first one, I suppose, is a question on the genetics, I suppose, there, you know, in terms of why, why are ICBF putting so much weighting on the milk production element of the suckler beef traits? Um, you know, I suppose the question is, 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 is beef carcass traits and confirmation traits, etc., cetera, not, not a more important one to be looking at when you're dealing with a, a beef animal? Yeah, it's a good question. I suppose the... Um... You know, if we go back to whenever we, you know, at the start of the BDGP and one of the concerns that we had was just in terms of just that downward genetic trend on maternal milk. And that was one of the big bits of feedback that we had got from uh, from farmers was that, you know, they were concerned there just wasn't enough milk in their cows in terms of that being a cost of production trait associated with getting a good, strong and heavy weanland for sale. And that's why certainly the economic value on maternal milk is, you know, it's a significant component of the replacement index. And um, it's a good, it's an interesting question because obviously we've turned that trend around and, and we've shown, shown in the, 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 the data earlier on, Alan, that it validates very, very well those high replacement index cows and herds were the ones that were getting the higher weanland efficiencies, the heavier weanlands and all. But it's one of these interesting traits that, you know, you can have too much milk as well. And, and certainly in the context of the, you know, we, we are undertaking a review of the replacement index and uh, the various traits contained within the replacement index, along with Chagas Grange. And um, and certainly that's an area that we are conscious and looking at that, uh, you know, given where we are now and we've turned the, we, we, we've turned that trend around. Do we need to continue to have that high weighting on maternal milk? And, and I think, uh, you know, the initial evidence would suggest that um, you know, as I said, you can push it too far and maybe it's it's one that we might end up pulling back a small bit and starting to shift some of the that economic value emphasis elsewhere. Okay. Um, I suppose this is kind of topical to what's slightly what's happening in media at the minute. I suppose we're seeing a lot on media about talks of threats of herd cuts and culls and fertilizer use of reductions, etc. And ministers denying there's any such thing happening, etc. But we, we talk a bit about, you know, 
the, 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 the reduction in carbon uh, for age of slaughter. Uh, and the question come in there is, you know, how do we account for that, you know, this um, reduction in carbon when you reduce the slaughter age? Is there any account taken, I suppose, of use, the use of imported grain and winter finishing as opposed to grass off 28, 29, 30 months? Um, you know, when you, when you, when you weigh it all up, is, is there a gain? Yeah, so I mean, there's two aspects to that. First of all, there's a cost aspect in terms of the mm. benefits of finishing cattle off grass, and and obviously, you know, the 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 lower costs associated with that, um, and and certainly that's a, a a relevant point, and 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 the only way that, you know, I suppose if we're going to encourage farmers towards considering, um, you know, a younger age at slaughter and effectively finishing those those cattle out of the house as two-year-old effectively two-year-old steers you know mm -hmm. is, is obviously as you as you as we intimated there on the it needs some sort of promotion or incentivization yes. uh, to help cover those costs and um, in terms of the second part of the question in terms of how does that you know how do you balance up the the net cost of carbon you know, um, in, in that grass-based system versus we'll call it a, a system that has some level of concentrate, concentrates, uh, imported concentrates and imported feed and fertilizer. Yeah, certainly there is a bit of a trade-off backwards, but um, but that does not outweigh the additional benefits that the age of the younger, the simply the younger age of slaughter brings. And, okay. and what's critical in that one is it's ultimately about taking animals off the inventory, the national inventory. It's right. really the inventory that drives carbon greenhouse gas output. So um, by helping to take animals off the inventory more quickly through traits such as age at slaughter or age at forced calving, calves per cow per year, etc., cetera, uh, you know, in terms of those infertile cows, um, then uh, they all have a higher impact in terms of greenhouse gas output. Okay, this is related to your, I suppose, the first question. You, you made a comment there about the downside of having too much milk, and someone said there, what is the downside of having too much milk in the cow? I suppose that there is a downside, like if you think about it in terms of just too much milk and the status and challenges with calves, you know, it, it and and certainly that's you know you know we've seen from other countries in terms of other breeds as they push too much in milk. The other factor there is that, you know, the cows start mobilizing, you know, it, it impacts upon female fertility, cow survival, you know, because again, that trait is antagonistic with survival traits. So, okay. so that's the downside of having too much milk. So it, it's a good example of a trait in suckler beef cows that you, you know, you, you want to reach an, a, a sort of on almost an intermediate optimum. And um, they were, okay. I don't believe as an industry where as an, we're at that intermediate optimum at this stage, but we've certainly moved. We're moving. We're moving towards it, which is a positive. Okay. Next one. There's a bit of a comment, but I suppose there's a question in it too. Um, farmers are doing a huge amount of work with regards weighing cattle in their lifetime, and I suppose what they're not getting is, you know, a live weight and a kilo percentage when cattle are slaughtered. Now, I suppose that's more to do with processors, so maybe it's a question for them, but. Would that be something that you and ICBF would see as being very beneficial if you had weight at slaughter versus kilo percentage for getting more accurate data? I think so, absolutely. And, and, and it's one look, we, we weigh all the cattle going from Tully, we weigh them at the mm. point of slaughter. And there's, you know, it's one thing, I look, uh, there'll be finishers on the, on, on the, on the call this evening. And, and it's one thing we'd absolutely encourage people to look at. I mean, there's so many benefits to it in terms of just getting a sense of weight gains. But even as the as the caller suggested, you know, well, it's it's that kill out percentage, and there's such a strong relationship between kill out percentage and and cost to feed feed efficiency. Mm. So you know, and I know it was one that there was some discussions about could would the meat or could would the meat processing industry consider you know weighing cattle at slaughter and starting to make that information available. And and I think that's a look. I think that would have to be seen as a very positive development. But I think if it were to happen, I would encourage people to look at it in the context of the additional positive data that it would bring to help it. technical efficiency on farms, mm -hmm. as opposed to trying to second guess, you know, the carcass weight relative to the, you know, the lay weight at slaughter. And is there some something else going on here? It, 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 let's focus very much on the the technical benefits of having that data and I would absolutely agree uh, okay. that it would be very valuable. Um, there's a comment there as well about uh, 
I suppose if the genetics are cumulative and permanent, uh, you know, are we still using a base baseline data from an animal from 20 years ago? Um, and has there been no improvement in the last 20 years to justify, I suppose, changing the baseline what we're comparing with our, our, our genetic improvement to? Well, first of all, I mean, those trends, you, you, I mean, at the end of the day, yes, you have to try and anchor against something, you know, which is going back to, to yeah, a, 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 across the range of traits, you know, whether it's, you know, the, the various traits in terms of uh, animals going back 15 years, 15 odd years. But but I think um, I think what's more important is one to understand what's happening with the trends relative to that base. Um, and then secondly, and this is the more crucial one. I would encourage farmers not to get caught up in the base, but rather to understand where your own herd is at. That's mm -hmm. what's key. So if you get your replacement index and you know you've a replacement index off your herd of 100 euros in terms of replacement index, what's most relevant then is to understand, well, are you getting that from, um, you know, the, the carcass weight piece, the growth in the calves piece? Or are you actually getting it more from milk and more from fertility? Because that really will help inform you in terms of, you know, the bull you need to buy or the AI straws that you need to use in terms of getting a more balanced improvement in that, uh, in your replacement index in, in, in the future. And, and that's certainly, a, I think, the more relevant question here and the more relevant approach, rather than worrying about the base, understand where your own herd is at. And you can get that from mm -hmm. the BDGP and through the, the Eurostar reports that are there. And I suppose it's a kind of a follow on question coming from that there then. You know, if, if we're looking at a base, you know, the current base is, say, uh, you know, a base of 315 kilos or whatever, weaning, you know, um, how far how, how far away are we from maybe increasing that base up, you know, to a, a much higher level compared maybe to, let's say, the poultry industry, the pig industry, etc. You know, is it possible that we can get to a, maybe a, a 450 or a 500 kilo weanling coming off a cow through genetics? Is that is that achievable? No. <laughs> no, <laughs> you get a ceiling. Don't worry, you know. Yeah. And 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 that's because look, you can't do, you couldn't do that without, you know, mm. getting a huge big cow either. So this is the idea right. of the economic indexes. You're going to, you know, you want to put away things on various traits that are going to drive overall profitability. But if you talk about it in terms of the what sort of gains are we are we making? You know, consistently we're seeing a half a kilogram of car. If, Carcass weight and well, it's carcass growth weight for age being a good example of a trait that you know has been increasing by about a half a kilo a year. And when mm -hmm. you express that relative to you know the gains that would be achieved in the suck, sorry, in the likes of the pigs and the poultry industry, well, look, they, they'd be running at one to two percent. I mean, but that's because of litter size and generation interval and all yes. of that. In the sucker, in the beef herd, I mean, you could see that we are akin to, to what's happening now in dairy. Um, but the sort of rates again we'd be achieving are, you know, you're down at a half a percent per year for those key traits. Okay, okay. Right, thanks very much, Andrew. Look, we're, we're a bit, I'm just conscious of time here. We, we always try and keep this under the hour. So look, uh, thanks very much for your contribution tonight. And I, I hope um, you, you, you've all uh, learned something and there's some valuable information given out there. This presentation will be available on the Chagas website tomorrow uh, for any of you that want to see it again. So um, you can tune into that uh, at your convenience. Thanks very much, Andrew, again, for your, for your help and, and all your information. And uh, good night to all. Thank you very much, Alan. Thanks.